Good morning. So welcome to the second day of the workshop. Uh, last uh, part of the workshop yesterday was, uh, I think, extremely productive, very helpful, and uh, uh, extremely good for NCPF and for what we can come up with some recommendations. Today, uh, we have two sessions. Uh, the morning session, um, or the first session, is how we take what we've learned from and how we look into the different areas of immuno-oncology into really practical implementation uh, for patient therapy and in the market. And uh, Malcolm Brenner would be um, leading the session, sharing it. So um, look forward to it, Malcolm. Uh, thanks. So, so in the talks and uh, in the discussion afterwards, we hope to be focusing on some and, uh, of these issues on the screen at the moment and hopefully other issues as well. And we'll begin with uh, Mark Dudley, who is uh, currently Director of uh, Cell Process Development in Cell and Gene Therapies in Novartis and was formerly at uh, NCI Surgery Branch. Thanks, Malcolm. All right. It's great to lead off the second day. We had a great day yesterday. So I'm going to talk about um, some CMC issues with scaling up cell therapies and scaling out uh, cell therapies, this particular type of immunotherapy. And to give you uh, a flavor of the challenges, um, I uh, just built a lab uh, at uh, Novartis. And I'm going to start with my disclaimer slide. Uh, it's the wrong way, I guess. Could you put them up again? Yeah. So I uh, am from Novartis, and um, this uh, talk is uh, uh, approved by Novartis, so that's enough of a disclaimer, I think. Let's see if I can move forward. Um, great. So um, just to give you a sense of uh, uh, the challenges, I uh, just built a lab there, and um, I asked some of the people, all of whom came from research labs, um, if they knew what CMC meant, and almost nobody did. Uh, so, of course, it's uh, chemistry manufacturing and controls. I had to explain that to um, these mostly academic people. So, uh, just to get everybody on the same page, uh, you'll remember yesterday Dr. Porter um, summarized some of the really uh, impressive early results from uh, the University of Pennsylvania clinical trials. Uh, uh, introducing these um, uh, CART-19 cells and their use in uh, CD19 positive tumors. I'm just putting up uh, a very brief summary of that here so we're all on the same page. Uh, in, in these UPenn trials for pediatric ALL, uh, a response rate of 93%. Um, in uh, lymphoma, 60%, uh, uh, mostly complete responses in uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Um, again, a great response rate. He went through these. Uh, these are patients who are heavily uh, pretreated with uh, refractory or um, disease, um, Some many of the patients post-transplant. The responses to uh, immunotherapy and especially CART therapy are um, typically durable. Uh, and um, in pediatric ALL, the responses are associated with a cytokine release syndrome. Um, the, uh, I, I won't uh, dwell on this except to say it's um, a very impressive therapy, and so we should figure out how to scale it. The, the thing about scaling an individualized therapy is uh, academic manufacturing processes are, are not capable of fulfilling global demand. The manufacturing process, as, as it is developed in an academic center, it's, uh, it's um, the product and the process, it, it continues to evolve in the center. And so that's not really appropriate for a commercial setting. Um, regulatory, uh, as we've seen in this meeting, the, the regulatory environment continue to evolve, continues to evolve. That's complicated for a commercial entity. Um, the current manufacturing processes are typically very manual. They involve uh, a lot of uh, people uh, in the process, and uh, that needs to uh, sort of 
change. Uh, and there's complex logistics. So how do we move that forward to something that would be appropriate for a commercial uh, process? I want to just uh, think about this uh, on this slide in, in four different buckets, uh, in the four quadrants of this slide. And I'll just focus on uh, one or two as examples. So in the upper right-hand corner, there's sort of a regulatory piece. In the uh, lower right-hand corner, um, there's a clinical piece. In the lower left-hand corner, there's a process piece. And in the upper left-hand corner, there's an analytics piece. And they all have to change in order to move something from an academic to a commercial uh, process. And so we could sort of uh, focus, for the sake of time, on the left-hand lower corner. In this process piece, it's, it's not that complicated to make, uh, to make individualized cells for patients. You get patients, uh, you bring them into the program, you get cells, uh, collect lymphocytes, you bring them into a laboratory and genetically modify them. You might uh, ex expand them. And then you uh, harvest and formulate them and give them back to the patient. So you've got these sort of four different process pieces. It's not that complicated. The, the thing is, in an academic center, the idea is that every patient that comes in needs to be treated. You, your goal is to get every patient treated. and the process can be very flexible. You can uh, use uh, whatever reagents, uh, sort of whatever process, 24 well plates, uh, three people in the hood, if that's what it takes. In, in a commercial setting, the idea is you have to get the process to work every time, and you can't change anything each time through. So there's real differences. But there's uh, moving from that inflexible from that flexible to that inflexible process, there's unexpected benefits. So when we move into a commercial setting, we get the opportunity to take each one of these unit steps and kind of shake it out and optimize it. And in an academic center, no one's ever had that opportunity. So we're, um, we're optimizing each one of these steps as we go. Uh, you can imagine that for each one of these um, pieces. It's complicated and it's challenging to go from, from an academic to a commercial uh, manufacturing process, but there are unexpected benefits when that happens. Another way of looking at this is moving from a, a principally uh, science-based to uh, and a development approach to a principally operations-based approach. Right now, we're sort of in the first two stages of this uh, for cell therapies. We're really in an early uh, uh, stage where we're really trying to understand the scientific uh, basis of immunotherapy, and we're, we're still trying to understand the key technologies responsible for getting this to patients. We haven't even started with really large-scale automation or uh, infrastructure for manufacturing. Uh, let alone the kind of global uh, development that would allow um, uh, supply chain uh, efficiencies. So these are some of the things to look forward to that will really help us with cost of goods and scalability uh, that's already available for small molecules and, and biologics. So I'm going to take a, a case study now um, from um, the CART-19 CTL-019 product moving from the University of Pennsylvania academic lab where they had such great clinical results and moving it into a commercial setting at Novartis. And this is uh, something that was done successfully over the last year and gives a good flavor for what it takes. The way uh, that this um, proceeded was really through a strong collaboration. Uh, it required a diverse a team that included members from academia, from GNP production, technical development, quality assurance, regulatory, really a, a team of a large number of different specialties put together. It, uh, it went through a stepwise process 
which is uh, outlined in this cartoon here. There were several major benchmarks, starting with a pre-transfer phase and then moving through into a major benchmark of a transfer phase and finally ending up with uh, a post-transfer phase. And you can see some of the intermediate steps. Uh, initially, uh, the commercial team watched the process, and, uh, made a process map, a risk assessment, went through a data mining exercises, uh, exercise, and finally set up um, uh, an industry 2B process that included several changes, including closing the process and um, making some commercially more appropriate steps. After that, the process was transferred into the commercial facility uh, where that was a major benchmark. Then there were first test runs, uh, training of the manufacturing staff, some split engineering runs, and uh, as far as I know, for cell therapies, this was a first with uh, taking an individual phoresis, apheresis product and splitting it between two sites and evaluating in a comparability study uh, how the um, transfer went. And uh, it was a successful process transfer, and um, we were able to manufacture then at Novartis. Now we started clinical manufacturing for patients, and uh, we're able to, at the, at the manufacturing facility, um, do routine review of process uh, capabilities at the facility. So you can see that's a complex process. Uh, and, and there were some expected uh, attributes that were predictable based on our pharma experience with small molecules and biomolecules. And then there were some things that were not really um, predictable in this individualized uh, patient therapy approach. So those are sort of um, demonstrated in this cartoon. The manufacturing portion of the product is uh, one of these boxes, which is shown in the, uh, in the bottom middle, manufacturing release. But really what's not, um, not needed in an academic center uh, for individualized products is the rest of the logistics supply chain. So um, for a, a multi-center, multi, um, uh, uh, even a globalized product, what's required is a complex supply chain that has to be built as well. And that's shown in this cartoon. The way that Novartis handles this is patients are identified, uh, they're enrolled in the study, and um, at that point, uh, the, um, the patient is uh, scheduled for the entire process. And you can imagine this isn't really necessary in an academic center where there's a small volume of patients. But if you're scheduling at multiple sites, um, even globally at multiple sites, uh, then this is a critical component. The patient starts their uh, therapy with an apheresis to collect blood cells. The product, uh, the apheresis product, is transported to the manufacturing site where that last piece that I showed you is accomplished. The product is uh, the... A uh, T-cell product is manufactured for the patient. It's transported back and released to the patient. Through all this, there's a, a number of other steps, um, labeling, uh, quality uh, attributes, um, uh, several other uh, uh, attributes that needed to be worked out in order to make this um, a, a feasible process. Some of the things that are different between a commercial and an academic or phase one setting, of course, you need to improve the quality. Uh, that's sort of demonstrated by clean room gowning, uh, close up the process, uh, improve the quality of individual reagents. And what's shown on the right here uh, in the yellow lines was one of the uh, process attributes that was um, available for the UPenn study. This is the expansion of cells. Uh, the range of expansion of cells. And you can see in, uh, in the commercial setting that we're uh, getting an even tighter range of expansion uh, when we improve the quality and the process characteristics uh, and have transferred the process. So um, we have successfully transferred the process as measured by this uh, in-process uh, metric. So, um, just a, a quick recap, um, the 
things that are necessary in terms of manufacturing, uh, better control of the uh, process, better process characterization, um, better control of raw materials, um, better product characterization. Our process development goals moving from phase one to commercial uh, in ensure the uh, clinical efficacy and product uh, safety. That has to be maintained. Uh, improve unit operations, starting with the most um, critical sort of the pain points in the process. Usually these are labor intensive. Uh, use deep analytics to define the, de uh, to define the design space, to characterize the, and understand the product, and to control and improve the process. And then uh, automate and functionally close and streamline the process. And so moving through these, uh, uh, these development goals, we can go from a phase one to um, uh, ultimately a commercialized process. Um, so uh, on the way there, we move from these goals on the left, which are appropriate for exploratory non-pivotal trials, validate new targets, identify biomarkers, test combination therapies, evaluate uh, new processes to what is appropriate for large uh, confirmatory trials and commercial production. Cost reduction, improved quality and safety, rapid production times, better patient-physician experiences, improved reliability, uh, fewer failures, and increased product understanding. So moving from small trials to large trials, we get all these benefits. And um, I'll just finish up by uh, thanking my uh, collaborators and um, thanking you for your attention.